Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to our fourth, I think, um, session in the autumn series. We're just going to wait for a few more people to join, so we'll probably give everyone another couple of minutes and then we'll begin. Okay, welcome to the session this afternoon. So this presentation is on osteoarthritis and lower back pain in lower limb amputees. There'll be three of us presenting, myself, so I'm Laura Ritchie, then we have Kate Davis and Dr Mike McGrath, and we have a further three people on the panel. So Ian Logue is one of our amputee demonstrators, Joe McCarthy is our senior consultant prosthetist, and then Kate Pierce, who is my colleague in the UK um, training and education team. So this session will be recorded. Uh, hopefully the, the next slide will come up. Thank you. Um, the session will be recorded. Everybody should be on mute. Um, if you have a question, there's a section on the right where you can ask the question. We'll monitor all questions and we'll answer them at the end of the session. And there are some handouts available to download in the handouts section. So one of them is the hydraulic ankle white paper. And then one contains some links uh, and some papers on what we're going to discuss today. If there, there are, there's one more um, webinar coming up next week, so you can still register for that one. And all the webinars have been recorded, so if you have missed any, you can you can listen to them. If you do have any questions, please um, email me at the address below, and I'll uh, you know if I can't answer the question, I'll, I'll forward it on to somebody else. So today we're going to go through um, some amputee biomechanics. Some of you might be rolling your eyes and your heads, but this is really to set the scene for why um, OA and, and lower back pain is such a big issue in amputees and therefore what we need to do to try and limit that. We'll review the literature and then we'll focus on some prosthetic solutions 
So these will be primarily, well, these will all be Blatchford solutions. So we'll talk about this technology, some of the features of this technology, and then we'll discuss the evidence for the technology. At that stage, we'll introduce Ian. He will tell us a bit about um, his experiences, and then we'll, we'll answer any questions that you have. So I'm going to hand over to Mike, who's going to talk through the biomechanics and the literature. Um, so over to you, Mike. Thank you very much. Um, so as if you've been to the previous webinars, you'll know uh, what we like to do is focus on the clinical evidence that's available uh, for the topics that we're talking about. Um, so again, this, this slide has been shown on previous webinars, um, but what we what we use clinical evidence for is um, these things, performance, safety, user benefits, and value for money. But where these all of these things interlink is ensuring the long-term health of the user themselves. So as, as I'm sure you're aware, um, of these four key secondary health outcomes that we've identified uh, that are common amongst amputees, uh, today we are going to talk about uh, lower back pain and osteoarthritis in particular. So as Laura mentioned, uh, the first thing we're going to consider is amputee biomechanics. So in order to do that, um, at the same time, uh, I'm going to be talking about uh, healthy biomechanics. And then we can understand the differences and where amputees differ from healthy biomechanics and therefore what issues are likely to occur because of these differences. Uh, the way I'm going to uh, approach it as well is to divide up biomechanics into three different areas. So the first of all, I've called preservation of clinical alignment. Um, more simply, you could describe that as just standing. Um, when you set up a limb in, in the clinic, it, statically, uh, you're trying to get a position that is comfortable for the user to stand in, um, but obviously the outside world can have effects. Uh, the second are called step-to-step -step transitions, um, but more basically we could describe this as walking, um, and in particular, the control of uh, the person's body mass being transferred from the prosthetic limb to the sound limb. Uh, and then I've given a complex title to the last one, other biomechanically complex activities, uh, by which I mean basically everything else. Um, so this this goes to walking on stairs, uh, standing from a chair, sitting down on a chair, turning, twisting, etc. Uh, so first of all, standing on flat ground. Um, so as I say, this is a, a rough representation of how you might statically align someone in a clinic. Um, I'm, I'm going to apologize for my drawings straight away. Uh, they are not necessarily to scale and not necessarily perfectly representative. They're just there to uh, give an indication uh, to help describe um, what I'm talking about. Uh, so the thing that, that we're doing, whether we're aware of it or not, um, when we align a limb, we are manipulating the ground reaction force in relation to the joint centers of that limb. Um, and the goal is to try and minimize the amount of effort, the, the, the strain on the joints uh, in order to keep that person upright and balanced. Uh, unfortunately, uh, like I say, the outside world isn't as perfect as the clinic. Um, and so things like slopes, like this incline here, uh, can effectively change the alignment artificially. Um, so you can see that the, the able-bodied representation on the left-hand side is just uh, dorsiflexed his feet, um, whereas the two amputees there are having to hyperextend the knee. Um, and if we look at the, the joint centers as well, you can see that um, the, yeah, you can see that hyperextension more clearly. And in particular, I want you to think about the, um, the fact if you're, wearing, if you're wearing a fixed ankle, uh, there is a defined equilibrium point where the, the toe spring and the heel spring uh, reach an equilibrium. Um, and when you're stood facing up a slope, that is inclined backwards. So you're constantly having to fight that toe spring in order to get the, the shank uh, vertical. And as a consequence, you might see that there is more load being put on the sound limb, which is the red arrows, than on the, uh, the prosthetic limb, which is the blue arrows. Additionally, when you, um, when you 
are facing down the hill, down a hill, uh, you might see uh, similar uh, adaptations. So I've done two different uh, adaptations that are quite common. Uh, the first in the middle there, the um, transtibial amputee is uh, resting their weight on the heel, and so the toes are actually off the surface of the ground. Um, and again, hyperextending the knee. So if I put the joint centers on, you'll be able to see um, you'll be able to see that the all the the weight is towards the back of the foot, and it's getting quite close to the um, the knee joint center. Obviously, if the ground reaction force on the prosthetic side goes posterior to the knee joint center, that's a bad thing then because you have to then resist the flexion moment that is created. Uh, you can see this in particular with the transfemoral transfemoral user on the right hand side. Uh, you can see there that the the ground reaction force is actually posterior to the knee joint center um, in order to get the foot flat on the floor. Um, so if you don't have any sort of MPK adaptation, which Laura will be talking about later on, um, that's going to require uh, the user to pull back on the socket with their residual limb in order to resist that, that uh, knee flexion. Or the alternative is to bear more weight on the sound limb and reduce the amount of force going through the prosthetic limb. So that was standing. This is the uh, walking or step-to-step -step transition. So again, healthy, able-bodied. Uh, at first contact, there's uh, some plantar flexion to comply with the ground and absorb some shock. Uh, there's a smooth dorsiflexion rollover. And then there's some push-off to provide propulsion. I should at this point again apologize for my animations. It's the best I can do. <laughs> um, the difference we see here, this is um, with again with a fixed ankle. Uh, there is no plantar flexion. So what that does is when in order to get the foot flat on the floor, uh, the shank actually rotates forward quite quickly. Um, this might be compensated for by flexing the knee, um, but it does put extra strain on that residual knee. Um, then when you're instead of dorsiflexion, uh, you're just relying on the compression of that toe spring, um, but you're constantly fighting that compression in order to get, um, in order to mimic dorsiflexion, the dorsiflexion action. Then at uh, push off, there is some energy being returned, uh, obviously from the, the carbon springs as they deflect, they store energy in them as they release it back uh, as, is, as the weight is lifted off them. Um, but with a fixed ankle, is not as much control of the direction in which that energy is released. So whether it's propelling you forwards or whether it's just pushing you upwards, um, one of which is helpful, one of which isn't. Um, and so in actual fact, the sound limb uh, provides most of the uh, propulsive force, typically. Um, you get the same situation when walking uphill. So you get a little bit of plant flexion in order to comply with the slope, a smooth dorsal flexion rollover, and then push off to provide propulsion. And the uh, the prosthetic foot with a with a fixed ankle has the same issues that it did on the level. So you're not plant flexing, you're not dorsal flexing properly, you're fighting that spring resistance, and then the uh, the energy return, the direction of the energy being returned, is not necessarily in conducive to uh, being propelled up the hill. Uh, downhill, you see the reverse effect. So you, you have a lot of plantar flexion in order to comply with the slope. This gets a foot flat on the ground, so it's a more stable position. And it also keeps the knee joint center behind that ground reaction force vector, um, which stops the knee from uh, buckling or having uh, requiring extra muscle um, strength in order to resist that buckling. Then you get a controlled dorsal flexion forward. So this helps manage the momentum buildup as you're walking down a slope. And then there's some push off as the weight is transferred uh, from the stance limb to uh, the swing limb. Uh, but that is controlled as well to make sure that it's not uh, overly overly weighted. Uh, with our amputee here, um, the lack of plantar flexion is even more, uh, yeah, plantar flexion is even more of a problem because it forces um, that shank to be inclined forward when walking down a hill. Um, so the risk there is, A, that it, it goes too far forwards and there's too much momentum being built up. But also, as you can see there, the ground reaction force might actually end up posterior to the knee earlier on in stance, um, which, again, is, is going to require uh, muscular action to resist uh, the knee buckling. And then because of that lack of control, there's potentially a heavier impact on the sound limb as weight is transferred 
to that side. Uh, this is the same, but I'm showing it in particular because just to highlight the point that uh, the gram reaction force passing behind uh, the knee joint centre is even worse for a transfemoral amputee because they don't have that that muscular control that the transtibial does. Um, and so again, you're, you're relying on either uh, pulling back in the socket with your residual limb or the technology that you're using in your prosthetic limb. And you have the same issue on the sound side. Uh, so finally, I'd, I think at this point, I've reached the limits of my animation skills. Um, but I wanted to highlight the, these other common activities that you might see that uh, I'm sure you've seen many of your patients do and you will recognize that the um, there is a tendency to put excessive load through the sound limb uh, and offload um, the prosthetic limb as much as possible, whether that be going downstairs, uh, sitting sitting down in a chair, standing up from a chair, or turning um, or twisting, turning around corners, that kind of thing. Uh, so now I'm moving on to, uh, to describe what the scientific evidence uh, says about these issues. So we know the different, the work, we can recognize the way that amputees walk compared to healthy individuals, uh, but what are, what does all that mean? What, why is that important? Um, so I've divided it up into four different categories. Uh, the first being prevalence, which is the rate at which these issues occur in different populations. Uh, then I'm talking about what the causes of these issues are, what are the consequences that arise from those people that are affected, uh, and what are the financial implications, finally. So this is um, the prevalence of osteoarthritis, uh, in particular in the hip and knee joints. So the green bars there show you uh, the rates for the general population. Um, obviously, there are a number of studies that have been published uh, based on based on these kind of rates. Um, so I'm trying to show a little bit of a range. Um, so roughly this is where most of the, um, the, the studies fall within these different ranges here. Um, but I mean, what, what is clear to see is that for lower limb amputees shown in red, uh, you, they are about two to three times more likely um, to experience osteoarthritis in these uh, particular locations. I should specify as well that these are um, specifically the sound hip and sound knee rates for lower limb amputees. Um, and when it says lower limb amputees, that is either because they haven't specified the amputation level or it's a mixed group of transtibial and transfemoral. In terms of lower back pain, you see at the top again in green, that's the, the rates uh, cited for the general population. Um, Lower limb amputees in red there, again, there's quite a broad range. Um, but in particular, the data I could find specifically by amputation level uh, showed that uh, transfemoral amputees, um, some studies have reported up to 81% of their participants um, suffering from uh, some form of uh, back pain. Uh, so the causes, so we, we saw the different ways in which um, amputees do particular activities, standing, walking, uh, more complex stuff. Um, but in summary, sort of on a broad level, the, the issue is mainly uh, asymmetry of loading. So because of that excessive dependency on the sound limb, um, more force is going through that and more force is going through the joints of that limb than it would uh, if they were a healthy, able-bodied individual. Um, and because of that, it's more susceptible to, to damage over time. Um, additionally, if you're leaning over to one side more often than you are the other, uh, that's going to put excessive strain on your back um, if you're twisting or leaning. Um, and so that's one of the causes uh, for the high rates of back pain. Uh, just on a side note, one thing that we're not particularly talking about in this, uh, this talk um, is the effect of not loading the prosthetic side enough, um, which can actually lead to quite high rates, uh, quite high rates of uh, osteoporosis in the uh, in the residual limb. Um, that's just something worth mentioning. We're not going to talk much more about that in this particular talk. Uh, so these are the uh, consequences. Um, there's a few statistics there. I should say this is for this is in general um, for these um, 
of these conditions, not specifically to amputees, but what these statistics show is the, the effect um, that these sorts of uh, conditions can have on people's lives. In particular, I think it's worth highlighting is uh, the bottom one there, um, where it states musculoskeletal pain can actually reduce social independence. I think that's something we're all very familiar with or have been the last, uh, what is it, nine months. Um, and you can really appreciate how much of an impact that can have on somebody's life, not being able to go out and uh, see their friends and go to work and uh, all that kind of thing. So importantly as well is the cost of all these things. Um, as I mentioned, uh, osteoarthritis and back pain can cause uh, a loss of independence and stop the, uh, the sufferer being able to go to work. Um, that has a financial implication, um, with one study estimating the loss of economic production in the UK to be around 3.2 billion um, based on uh, musculoskeletal diseases. Um, that's on top of the 303 million for osteoarthritis treatment in hospitals and the 850 million pounds that go towards joint, plate, joint replacements every year. Uh, Back pain is even more of an issue. Um, you can see there that the uh, the green section on the pie chart, that's the, uh, the cost of treatment. It's about 1.6 billion every year. Um, that's about five times uh, the amount that was um, going towards osteoarthritis. And to put that into some sort of context, that's approximately 1% of the total budget of the NHS. Um, so clearly this is a big issue. And again, in terms of loss of economic production, there is a variety of uh, studies estimating what that might be. Um, and it could go from anywhere from £5 billion a year to £10.7 billion a year. So that, that's why we've got that dotted section of the pie chart there. That's sort of anywhere from the first section to the whole of the blue. Um, but the, the takeaway message here is that it has a huge effect on the, on the on the finances of the country. Uh, so now I'm going to hand you over uh, back to Laura, who will talk you through some of the prosthetic technologies that can help to reduce the likelihood of these problems occurring. Thanks, Mike. So I'm just going to go through some of the Blatchford technologies, so current technology, looking at the, the subcategories that we talked about. So essentially standing, um, walking or step to step transitions and then other other activities so these would be sit to stand stand to sit stairs um, and turning so if we look at um, the first of our products I think we all agree that microprocessor needs have clinical benefits for the end user some of the benefits have been published and obviously we'll come to these later in the um, the evidence section but just as a very brief overview, the Orion 3 is a microprocessor and it combines hydraulic and pneumatic control to provide five different sort of situations where we have stand stability. So when we consider standing, there's an IMU in the knee which is able to determine whether the amputee is moving or whether they're stationary. And when they're stationary, the knee will provide an increased resistance to knee flexion. So it'll go to a very high level of resistance, meaning that the amputee can stand with their full support on the prosthetic side, or, or really what I mean is even loading on both sides. And this will happen regardless of the level of terrain. So on slopes, the knee will remain in this high resistance, even in a flexed position, as you can see from the video. When we think about walking, we have a high level of stand stability with the knee remaining in that high stand stability until late stance. And the on, it's only released when the knee is extended, but also when there's a sufficient load on the toe, then it will drop to a lower resistance. For walking down slopes, the user will benefit from a yield resistance, which will give controlled knee flexion on the prosthetic side, therefore allowing a timed uh, ground contact from the intact side. And then looking at other activities, so this same yield gives control for stairs, descent and sitting. And the aim, especially in sitting, is to allow even weight distribution between both legs, meaning that the intact knee is not being overused or overloaded. 
And then we also know that um, hydraulic ankles have known benefits in reducing the risk. So hopefully the, the next slides will come up. Sometimes there's a bit of a timing delay, um, usually user error. Um, but we know that hydraulic ankles also benefit reducing the risk or the onset of osteoarthritis and the prevalence of lower back pain. So the plantar flexion seen from the ankle allows the user to stand with more balance, as you can see in the top video. Some of you have seen these videos many times, you probably see them in your sleep, but they really, they, they're great for highlighting the effects of, um, of, the, ankle, of the hydraulic ankles. And we can see, especially as the, the AK amputee at the front stands standing, he's able to stand in a more stable position compared to the below knee amputee, which given that the, the below knee amputee obviously has full control of his knee is surprising, but it's purely a result of the ankle conforming to the ground. And we know just visually that the, the BK amputee is taking more weight on his intact side because the left knee, his intact knee, is staying extended during the movement, whereas the AK amputee is able to bend both his knees evenly, which is indicating that he has even load on both legs. And then we also see the difference walking down a slope. So the same person is walking down the same slope um, on the same day, and the only change is that a fixed ankle has been swapped for a hydraulic ankle. And I think you'll, you'll kind of agree with me that the difference in stability and control is quite evident. We can further um, we can take this one step further by introducing a microprocessor in a hydraulic ankle, as we've done with the Elan. And this gives the additional benefits of having standing support at the ankle, which effectively provides greater stability compared to just the Echelon, which we know is already a great product in static standing. So essentially meaning less effort required to perform the activity. And with the, with the microprocessor detecting the changes in terrain, the foot will also provide braking control for walking downhill and give assistance walking uphill. So further promoting symmetry in walking and greater reliance from the prosthetic sides. And Kate will go through some of the, some of the evidence for this in just a, a few minutes. So looking at level, level ground standing, so the first of our activities being standing, we wouldn't really expect there to be much difference coming from having a fixed ankle compared to sorry, having a hydraulic ankle compared to a fixed ankle um, in a non, non microprocessor hydraulic ankle because the bench alignment should be giving us some geometric stability. However, we do know that there's a benefit from the standing mode from the LAN and from the Orion 3, which we'll cover in the next section. And then for uphill standing, the dorsiflexion in the hydraulic ankle means the user can stand with their joints in more alignment. So the ground reaction force vector passes in front of the ankle, which creates the dorsiflexion moment, and in front of the knee, creating an extension moment. When we compare this to a fixed ankle, the tendency is for the user to, to either load the toe, in other words, the heels off the ground, and they have a smaller base of support, or, as Mike said, they'll rock back, as shown, to keep the foot flat on the ground. So this means there's more load on the intact limb, as you can see by the pink arrow when you compare it to um, the other one. And if we progress on to downhill standing, so again, the benefit of the ankle articulating, we've got this plantar flexion, meaning that the hip, the knee and the ankle joint are in, in more, more alignment, so therefore less muscle effort required to maintain stability. And this is further enhanced by having the standing mode switched on on the Orion. Comparing this to a fixed ankle, the options are to either stand with the foot flat on the ground and the knee flexed, or, the, or having the weight on the heel with the knee extended. And in both cases, there's more load on the intact side, again, as you can see by the, the magnitude of the pink arrow. The standing mode on the Orion will help in the middle picture, so with the, with the foot flat on the ground and the knee flexed. However, because one knee is flexed and the other one's extended, there will be some pelvic asymmetry, which will likely cause lower back pain. When the knee is extended, 
again, there's that this smaller base of support and therefore more muscle effort um, needed to maintain stability. We would then expect that the amputee would then have more hip flexion in order to get the, the body centre of mass over the base of support to maintain balance. And therefore, you'd see more lordosis at the lumbar spine to maintain an upright position. So this will also increase the prevalence of lower back pain. And in both these fixed ankle cases, the, the user would the amputee would need to shift their body position. So likely they would continually shift between the two scenarios, whereas this isn't necessary with the hydraulic ankle. So moving on to our walking, so step-to-step -step transition. During level ground walking, there's ground, compli ground compliance from the foot plantar flexing, which also maintains an extension moment on the knee in loading response. The dorsiflexion of the foot and the resistance to knee flexion mean that there's less need for hip hiking or for, for trying to, to shift so to elevate the centre of mass so that there's a to get the rollover. So we have this smoother rollover because of the dorsiflexion of the ankle. And then going into swing, the propulsion of the foot is more in the line of progression rather than being a bit vertical because the user is able to, to bear weight on the toe for longer as the foot stays dorsiflexed. So with enough load on the toe at the correct time, the knee will then flex as the intact limb contacts the ground. And the foot then stays dorsiflex, giving increased clearance for swing and also reducing compensation such as vaulting. For uphill walking, it's very similar with the additional benefit from the Alan providing this increased heel spring and a, re a reduction in resistance from the toe. And this results in an even smoother rollover when compared to the echelon um, and more push up the hill. So meaning, again, less effort from the amputee when they're walking uphill. And finally, downhill walking, we can see the plantar flexion at the ankle again provides increased stability at the knee. The Alan gives extra braking control by softening the heel, so reducing the plantar flexion resistance and stiffening the toe. So increasing the dorsiflexion resistance, which slows the progression um, of the shank through stance. Then after mid stance, the knee flexion moment is controlled by the stance resistance in the knee until late stance, when again having the load in the toe um, will, will reduce the resistance in the knee and allow for a natural release into swing. And if we connect the knee and the foot, this provides further security and standing. So as, as a whole prosthesis provides resistance to the movement. So when we look at the links, the additional benefit of the ramp control in the links provides further control coming down the slopes as there's enhanced resistance at the knee to complement the braking effect from the foot. So rather than the user either having no yield um, or having yield on those interim slopes. We mean that it means that the intact limb doesn't land prematurely. So we have this um, resistance, this plantar flexion from the foot, also this breaking from the foot, but we also have this ramp mode from the knee. So it's an interim resistance without having to use the full yield resistance. And therefore we can preserve the joints on the intact limb because it doesn't come into contact with the ground too soon as the resistance in the knee stays high enough. So thinking about turning, so moving on to these other movements, turning is something that's done all the time, but it, it has little credit compared to, to walking. In a rigid pylon, you can see the torsional forces are absorbed by the residual limb, the proximal joints and the lower back. Whereas with a torsion adapter, the forces are absorbed by the prosthetic component, which results in less strain of the joints and particularly the lower back, which effectively is reducing back pain. And then our next um, activity, this is a key activity, um, especially for me, I would say, like, as we're more restricted to being at home, going from sit to stand or vice versa, I myself seem to spend quite a lot of time getting up to get drinks or 
more snacks um because i've eaten all the other snacks while binge watching on tv so rather than doing lots of walking um, i spend seem to be spending a lot of time sitting and standing and to make this easier when we have a hydraulic ankle the increased dorsiflexion range from the ankle allows the center of mass to come over the base of support which means less demand on the joints when standing up and then for sitting Yielding knees in general provide resistance to knee flexion for extra support when sitting down. And with the Orion, it takes us one step further because we can provide a proportional resistance depending on the knee flexion angle. So in the same way, our knee extensor muscles control the rate of knee flexion and work harder at a larger knee flexion angle, the resistance from the Orion will ramp up as the angle of flexion increases. So this results in even loading between the limbs and therefore greater kinetic symmetry during, during sitting. And this is also a benefit coming down the stairs. So again, in a standard yielding knee, you often see a premature ground contact. So you can see this on the, the top picture um, where there's, there's ground contact on the step from the intact, the intact limb as the yield is effectively running out, if that's the right phrase to use, running out of resistance. So it means that there's increased load through the intact limb joints. Whereas this enhanced yield that I discussed for the previous slide on the Orion, it means that the knee flexion on the prosthetic side is controlled for longer. And so that the timing coming downstairs is more even or is better. So I'm going to pass you now to Kate, who's going to talk through um, the evidence for the, the different Blatchford technologies that we've that I've just discussed. So over to you, Kate. Brilliant. Thanks, Laura. Uh, hi, everyone. Um, so we'll get straight into it. Um, one thing we look at when we study the development of secondary conditions in prosthetics is the magnitude of the support moment in each limb. So the support moment is the sum of the moments at each joint. This indicates the demand being placed on the limb and how much the user is relying on it to support their weight. And different people compensate in different ways when they're walking. So the support moment is really good because it encompasses all of the different possibilities. The magnitude of the moments can also indicate abnormal forces going through the limb, which obviously, as we've heard, can contribute to the development of both OA and lower back pain. Therefore, the de more demand is placed on the limb, the higher the likelihood of pain there is of pain developing. And to combat this, we want to start by changing the distal joint, which then affects all the joints higher up. When comparing the support moment in individuals wearing different types of prosthetic feet, we can see how this affects the forces that occur. So this is shown in the graph here. So the fixed ankle is represented by the gray bars, the hydraulic ankle by the green bars, and the microprocessor foot, microprocessor hydraulic foot um, is the navy bars. Um, so you can see here that in general, the sound limb has a greater support moment compared to the prosthetic side. And we expect this, like this is generally prosthetic users rely more on the sound, sound limb, we know this. But we can see that with a hydraulic foot, the moments on both sides are reduced. And this is further improved by adding the microprocessor control to the limb. In fact, with the microprocessor control, we can see that not only are both of the moments reduced, but the loading on the limbs is also more equal. This indicates fewer gait compensations, so the knee and the hip aren't having to flex um, more for the foot in order for the foot to lie flat against the slope. We've, um, so we've seen how the addition of hydraulics affects alignment, especially on the slopes, but why does the addition of microprocessor control have su make such a difference? Well, Laura's spoken about this a little bit already. The microprocessors in the foot detect changes in terrain and increase the hydraulic damping accordingly to give to, in order to give support, which essentially means the user ha is, requires less effort to perform the activity. This addition of standing support at the ankle provides greater stability compared to the echelon in stand static standing. This not only reduces the moment on the prosthetic side by 43%, but when compared to a rigid ankle, it also has a massive effect on the sound limb. The user is less reliant on the sound limb for bracing, 
And so the result is a 41% reduction in sound limb support movement compared with a hydraulic foot and a massive 59% reduction when compared to hip rigid ankles. It also allows for the knee moments to be within the natural range when we're looking at bi bilateral users, which is illustrated, illustrated here. Here, a bilateral user is standing on a slope whilst wearing our different types of prosthetic feet. As expected, with the fixed attachment foot, we see compensation at the knee with additional flexion. What's interesting though, is when we use hydraulic ankles on both sides, because there's no sound side to control the movement, the wearer actually ends up compensating more because they rest at the end of the dorsiflexion range of the ankle, meaning that the shank moves forward and the knee has to flex. This is where the standing moment of the microprocessor foot comes in. By detecting the gradient and the subsequent movement, the damping in the ankle is increased so that the correct alignment is maintained without additional effort needed from the user. A similar type of control can be found in the Orion 3, as Laura has mentioned. Here, the knee is paired with both a fixed and a hydraulic ankle, and the asymmetry between limb loading was measured with the knee's standing mode on and off. With both the fixed ankle and standing mode off, which is the image on the far left, the asymmetry between the limbs reached up to 9% with joint compensation and bracing occurring. There's very little difference between the other three, as all of them improve the symmetry, which that is bringing the the level of asymmetry closer to zero. The scale of reduction found in the two middle com um, combinations, though, shows that the addition of either the standing motion, at the standing mode of the microprocessor knee, or the addition of a hydraulic ankle, both massively reduced the asymmetry between the limbs. However, the best result was found with the combination of both features, which is on the far right. This is when the ankle the hydraulic ankle is aligned to the slope and standing mode was applied to help control the proximal movement. So we've, st we've spoken about static alignment. Now we want to look at what happens in dynamic movement. Again, the ability for the most distal joint to adapt has a large impact here. And when we compare echelon to a fixed ankle, we get some compelling results. Firstly, when the pressure was measured underneath the foot of the sound limb, a reduction of 26% was found with the hydraulic ankle, implying less reliance on the sound side. This is reinforced by another study where the work done um, well, sorry, where the work done by each limb was measured and compared. The work done by the sound side reduced by 17% because users had more confidence in their prosthetic side with the work done by the prosthetic limb increasing by 14%. This means greater symmetry was seen between the two sides. Looking back at the health of the residual limb, which we covered in our last webinar, hydraulic ankles have been shown to reduce the stress within the socket by 81% and the loading rate in the socket by 87%. Pain and abnormal loading on the residual limb not only affects the limb directly, but may cause the wearer to change their walking pattern in order to offload the limb out of the socket. This adds unnecessary loading to their sound side, increasing the chances of developing osteoarthritis. The hydraulic ankle also provides greater toe clearance than a rigid, rigid attachment. This reduces the likelihood of a trip occurring because the user, and because the user then has more confidence in the limb, they don't feel the need to compensate with their gait by vaulting or hiking up their hip which massively reduces the stress placed on the lower back and reduces the likelihood of back pain. When we look at walking on slopes, the alignment gives assistance while walking uphill. The resistance to plantar flexion is increased, meaning more energy is stored and then subsequently released from the heel spring. This increases the contribution of the prosthetic side during propulsion, which again reduces the reliance on the sound limb. There's also a reduction in dorsiflexion dorsiflexion resistance, which means that the progression over the foot is easier and the user doesn't feel like they're having to climb up and over the foot. In downhill walking, the resistance to plantar flexion in the alarm is reduced. This means that the foot can comply with the slope quicker and easier, so there's less need for the knee to flex to compensate for shock absorption. It also means that the shank isn't thrown forward, so the knee stays behind the ground reaction force and is more stable. In addition to this, 
the resistance to dorsiflexion is increased. This helps again to control the rotation of the shank over the foot, making it slower. And it also helps to prevent the buildup of forwards momentum, meaning that the ankle doesn't have to do as much work in order to break. The result here is a greater support of body weight and much less reliance on the sound limb. So because of the nature of most gait studies, regardless of gradient, we measure the way someone walks along a straight line. But in reality, most of us don't just walk in a straight line at a constant speed. We're also always changing speeds or directions and stopping and starting. So this can put a lot of strain on joints, especially when changing directions or twisting, which is where a shock and torsion absorbing pylon, like we have in our VT feet, can help. Most wear it, users who wear one report feeling more comfortable in their socket, but how much of that positive feeling is quantifiable? Well, research has shown that the safety of users is improved with a torsion adapter. A reduction in back pain was seen during golf swinging, and while that study was specific to golf, the same type of movement is frequently used in everyday life, and the benefits are seen in other tasks in involving trunk rotation. Mobility is also improved, with the device reducing compensatory knee flexion at loading response, and therefore providing a more symmetrical gait. Research comparing a rigid pylon to a shock absorption pylon has also shown that users had a preference towards the latter. Patients cited improved comfort, smoothness of gait, and easier stairs descent with the VT pylon. Improvements can also be seen when studying the start-stop motion so often seen in daily life, which adds a lot of strain to joints. When looking at how amputees come to a stop when walking downhill, the braking strategy of the Lynx microprocessor control, that is the controls in the Alan ankle and the Orion 3 knee, mean that the prosthetic limb did more work. As a result, this reduced the work done by the patient's joints on the residual and sound sides and improved the symmetry between the two limbs compared to when the braking modes were switched off. The authors surmised that the test participants had more confidence in their prosthetic, prosthetic limb um, to stop themselves when the braking control was active. Now we've spoken a lot about the development of osteoarthritis and it's true, we can definitely measure that in indicating factors, but it's really tricky to measure something that isn't actually happening or has a very slow progression. A much more direct measure, measure is acute pain in both the back and contralateral limb. It could be argued that focusing on reducing the causes of this pain will also have a more immediate effect on patients and will improve their quality of life in the short term, as well as having longer term effects. So looking at how often patients experience pain in their lower back and contralateral limb, we can see improvements in both both when using hydraulic and microprocessor feet compared to a fixed attachment. The addition of the hydraulic compliance has the most effect on lower back pain, which is to be expected due to the improvement in alignment. However, the pain in the contralateral limb is, is particularly interesting. Here, you can see that both the pain in the contralateral, um, both the interventions result in a very clear step improvement. Firstly, the hydraulic limb improves alignment and reduces the initial asymmetry. And then the addition of the microprocessor control on top of this helps the patient to be less reliant on their sound limb, offloading the joints on that side so that the pain is greatly reduced. The intensity and the bothersomeness of the pain was also measured. On this graph, a higher score indicates that the pain was more mild, so a higher score is better. Uh, we can see that the substantial improvements are seen in both the intensity of pain and how bothersome it is, and this was found with the addition of hydraulic movement and microprocessor control. That, combined with the reduction in how often the pain occurs, which we saw in the previous graph, both make for very compelling arguments for these technologies. So that's us. <laughs> We're done. Um, if you're wanting to know more about hydraulic ankles, or just wanted a reminder of what we've covered today, we do have a white paper that can be downloaded from our website that explains some of these results and the mechanisms behind them. Uh, that's also available to download from our handout section here on the webinar. Um, and we also have a handout that has all the useful links for some of the various studies we've looked at in this presentation. Um, just before we open up to any questions, we have Ian Logue here with us. 
Um, Ian is one of our demonstrator amputees, and so he's just going to speak to us quickly about his experience with osteoarthritis and of lower back pain. Over to you, Ian. Thanks, Kate. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I'll just uh, give you a brief background on myself. Um, I'm 56, uh, became an amputee 39 years ago due to an RTA, obviously above the amputee. Um, and throughout that, I've been lucky enough, I think from 1992, joined the Blatchford team and worked with the R&D section with the development of um, uh, MPKs. So I think that I've had um, in my time probably uh, from PSPC to hydraulic onto um, the adaptive links and now Orion. Now, as um, Kate mentioned, um, I've had some problems with um, osteoarthritis. Um, that started back sort of more than 20 years ago uh, in my early 30s. And uh, that seemed to, um, the arthritis hasn't really developed that much, if you consider it's been over 20 years, uh, and seems to correlate with the use of um, the microprocessor controlled limbs. Um, also, within the last sort of decade or so, I started to develop back pain as well um, and had it looked at as basic like L4, L5 um, disc bulge, um, which thankfully hasn't seemed to have progressed. And um, my last experience with the consultant, uh, he indicated that my back was no different to any other 50 year old. So hopefully, um, all these products are uh, helping to uh, uh, stave off the pain. Um, how does that seem to do it for me? Uh, I think that the, the fact that these um, MPKs are bespoke items, they can be uh, programmed individually to, my, to tailor my needs, um, as opposed to just having sort of a hydraulic uh, knee, which there is some adjustment, but not as much as the MPKs. For example, in the stairs mode or the ramp mode or the sitting mode, uh, I find that I'm more evenly balanced now. I can put more um, more weight through the uh, prosthetic side than I could with the uh, hydraulics because or the just the standard PSPCs because I'm not focusing too much on control there, uh, um, on placing the placing the leg etc. and putting weight through it uh, because I know that these limbs are actually you've got the assistance the hydraulic control there. That, um, that gives me some support. Um, the uh, in terms of um, uh, where am I? I'm sorry, my daughter's at the door. <laughs> okay. Um, right. So. So I've lost my train of thought there. Um, where was I, Kate? Or Laura? Uh, you were talking about how sitting was improved. You felt you could do that easier since having the MPK and the, the hydraulic ankle rather than just your standard yielding. And then um, you sort of moved on to just talking about what then. Really. Talking about what, sorry? Well, why, why don't we, if, there, if there's any questions, why don't we take some questions? Because I've got a feeling some of the questions are going to be directed to you. Yeah. Ian, yeah. And then okay. that way you can ask them. Um, Kate, have you got any questions? Yeah, there's a question for you here, Ian. Um, just asking about what your favourite combination of prosthetic components is. Um, obviously, you've talked about having the microprocessor units. Yeah. In the youth, microprocessor units aren't as widely available, particularly the feet. So just having tried a few of the different components that we offer, which is your preferred combination? My preferred combination at the moment is the, um, the Orion and the um, uh, extended range um, foot, the Echelon. Uh, I think that combination gives me uh, I've got the right um, assistance there from in terms of uh, controllable limb, in terms of walking, 
uh, how I can control the um, resistance for uh, coming downstairs, ramps, etc. I can do this to a certain degree individually. Um, the hydraulic foot, so I'm in the ER, I absolutely love that. So I'm in that, the advent of that one, I've had it for probably nine months now. It, it's, it's incredible foot, the amount of control you've got. In particular, I, I feel coming down uh, and going up slopes, it's just second to none. Great, and another one here. How would you compare the extended range echelon with the vertical torsion, the VT? In terms of preference. It, yeah, to be honest, I mean, it, 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 it's been a while since I've worn, uh, worn um, the uh, VT because I think there might be an issue in height in terms of uh, the build, whether I can fit one in or not, I don't know at the moment, but my experience from previous ones, um, I would say that I do miss it to a certain degree, but the uh, extended range is a good compromise because of um, it, it's, it's able to go a little further instead of skipping over the foot, um, you are able to actually power through it. So I don't really, I, I don't think I can answer the VT part of it, but hopefully the, the ER um, I can. That's brilliant, Ian, thank you very much. There's another question here aimed at a prosthetist, I think. Um, if you aren't able to fund bilateral lands, what's the next best thing for bilateral patients? Um, Joe or Laura, if you want to answer that one. Uh, I was waiting for Joe's answer. <laughs> I think, I mean, the echelons, in my view, even just for standing, they still, although as Kate mentioned earlier, we, when, we, when there was a study done, we found that people were, they were leaning at the edge of the dorsiflexion stop. So that was encouraging a sort of um, crouched gait position. However, it's still, if we, that they're still stable. So the, the amputee that we did that study on, she still felt really comfortable standing. She just felt better with the lands. But when compared to when she had fixed ankles, she was definitely more stable just, just in standing and for sure more stable, more comfortable walking with the echelon. So she's she's kind of had all three and her preference is definitely the Elan, but she's still, um, she's still better off with just the echelons compared to fixed ankles. Yeah. The only thing I would say, Laura, I think I think I'd agree with you. So, like, I would go provided the person has got good balance and good control. I think I, I would go for echelons, and I'd probably go for sort of like echelon VTs if if I could, because of the, the torsional compliance that that they've got and that bit more shock absorption. But um, I mean, the 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 thing that was showing there when when Mike was showing it, uh, or was it Kate, where the, the the amputee was standing on the slope, the bilateral with the feet side by side. I mean, sort of. It's a little bit false, isn't it, in terms of like, all right, somebody's standing, they they may, you know, on the level surfaces, you know, bilateral, sometimes you do see them go on the stops that way, but not everybody. But you're more likely to see one standing with one leg slightly in front of the other. And that way they're not resting on the stops and, you know, they've got a larger base of support. So I think that's a little bit um, not contrived, that's that's putting it a little bit harshly, but uh, you know, it's that specific situation where you don't normally stand on the slope with your feet side by side. You know, you, you would have one in front of the other and, and broaden your base that way. Um, there was a, another comment there where sort of, I, I was gonna add a, li a little bit about the VTs and things like that. And, and I know when we were developing the Echelon ER, there was one chap in particular transfemoral chap, absolutely loved it for walking, moving around, and he found he could walk up and down steeper slopes with a, a normal walk, like reciprocating gait, um, with an ER than he could with a regular echelon, um, or with a regular echelon VT is what he had. However, when he was at work, this chap was a painter, and he really missed the torsion, and it, he found it much, much harder to do his job with with a, without the uh, torsional compliance there so that, those are the only things i was going to add really i mean the other thing i tell you what i will say one more thing ian i thought at one time um you there was talk about surgery on your knee and uh, and you know i know you're having trouble with your back at the time and i think 
at the time, I think we had you on a Lynx and then suddenly sort of like that pain just dropped away. Um, can you remember that or am I remembering this wrong? No, I mean, surgery has been discussed on um, both the knee and, and the back, um, both of which they said, particularly on the knee at the time, being in early 30s, far too young. Um, and also 10 years ago um, on the back, they said um, stave off as long as possible. Surgery is an option, but um, try and keep your back intact as much as possible. So I do think that potentially uh, it seems to coincide with going on to the Lynx and the Orion. So hopefully it's, it's helped me put off uh, surgery, which in the back is probably not imminent and, and it's not absolutely necessary. Uh, but in terms of the knee, eventually it will mean knee replacement. Obviously that's something you want to avoid, isn't it? Do you, what, do you notice anything absolutely. with the with, with ground clearance in? Do you ever notice that? I mean, because that's something that a lot of people sort of talk about um, and, and mention. Ground clearance with the hydraulic ankles, do you notice any difference there or, or is it just you've had them so long you don't really know anymore? Well, I do kind of get used to them, but obviously that there, there is some benefits in ground clearance because if you're looking at um, sort of, uh, say, the hydraulic limbs where you power through, your tendency is to either vault, um, hip hitch uh, in order to, to make, make it clear the ground. And I don't do that anymore. Uh, ever since I've started using the microprocessor controlled. So I would have to agree probably that there is a difference there and you don't skip over, um, which is again is, is another um, symptom, I guess, of using hydraulics. I was tending to skip over the limb and probably lo loading the um, sound side too much. Um, whereas when I went on to the microprocessor, because I could pre-program the, um, the assistance for me, it wasn't necessary anymore. Then I could focus more on transferring my weight onto the sound side and thereby having the, the like the ER, the, it makes it more controllable because you don't have to skip over the foot. Um, it's more of a natural movement and um, you can direct the weight through it um, quite comfortably. Thanks, Ian. There's a hand raised here. Hey there, Ali. I'll just try and unmute you so you can answer your ask your question. And you might have to unmute yourself, actually. Are you able to unmute yourself? Sorry, I'm really struggling to unmute you there. I think you've muted yourself, so we'll have to move on. If you want to send us an email, I'm, we'll be happy to answer it. At another time. Um, thank you very much. That's the end of the session. So, as I said, if you have any questions at all, feel free to ask them, send them emails. You'll be able to access this recording on our website and you can access any of our handouts through here as well. Thank you for attending. We'll see you on the next one. <laughs>